What does it mean to be a conservationist in Mississippi? If you have any ideas, please let me know afterwards because I'm still trying to figure that out myself. I am from Mississippi. I grew up outside of Jackson in central Mississippi, and I'm here today to talk about diversity and biodiversity and how I believe to be a conservationist in Mississippi, you have to understand that these two terms are not mutually exclusive but are more so um, connected in a way that they support one another and that to do conservation in Mississippi, you have to embrace both. Um, in my world of ecology, of conservation, biodiversity is seen as the metric stick by how you measure an ecosystem's health. And in the world of anthropology and sociology, I would say that particularly nowadays, Diversity is seen as the means with which you measure the health of a community. Bringing together all of those different religions, sexual orientations, political backgrounds, these all bring experiences and histories that together when brought to in one unit provide the foundation for what makes us a species. And so I want to talk about how my journey began. Um, I remember in first grade, I had a good friend named Kenyatta and wanted to bring him over to spend the night one weekend and ask mom. And she said, yeah, of course, get his phone number. And so I did the next day and mom called up Kenyatta's mom and Kenyatta was African American. And his mom didn't really understand why we would want Kenyatta to stay overnight. Why, why, why not just come hang out? Why did you need him to stay overnight? And it was a first time that I had ever thought about differences in that obviously I could recognize we were of different skins of color, but that there are differences within our cultures and how we perceive the world. And I think from that point forward, I began a journey of asking questions and in doing so got to the point where I am today. And so I want to talk a little bit about Mississippi and, and what it was to me. You know, as I got older, I began to investigate the history of how we have treated our land, but also how we have treated each other, and that those two things intertwined. And I was appalled as I grew older to learn how we treated the land, and how we treated the land was a result of how we treated each other. And I became disenchanted with Mississippi. I felt that Mississippi didn't have anything to offer me. The flora and fauna that I wanted to explore, what I wanted to learn about, the cultures that were rich, they were all someplace else. They were in Europe or the species in Africa or whatever it might be. And so I left. I went and studied school in college up on a mountain in Tennessee. Yeah, Sawani's right. And in that time, as my dad might say, I got a degree in rocks and trees. And in exploring rocks and trees, I recognized that our understanding of who we are and what makes a sense of place as a people is completely entwined with how we interpret our surroundings. And so from Suwannee, I moved out to Portland, Oregon, and I ordered a beer at a bar one time, and I got scolded for telling a woman, yes, ma'am. And I moved on to Austin, Texas, and I lived there for five years and got really engaged with the grunt work of what it means to try to save a single species and everything that goes into that. And I started wearing bolos, and I started wearing wranglers. And I eventually recognized that with all of the work that was being done around the world, and even in a place like Austin, what's Mississippi going to do? And so I came back. And in my time away, I recognized that Mississippi possessed the most diverse biotic community of plants in the entire North American continent. The long-leaf pine savannas of our coastal plains which used to stretch from Texas all the way up to Virginia. And I recognized that the best music, the best literature, the best art, I think the best characters, came out of this state. But only 3% of that longleaf pine savanna habitat in the U.S. remains today. And I do not believe that the individuals that came out of Mississippi we're so talented because of our support for education. So where does this leave us? I want to take you on a journey back in time 
to a place at the headwaters of the Coldwater River, which is just about 30 miles north of us today here in Oxford, Mississippi. This place was the sacred land of the Chickasaw Indians. They knew everything of its valleys, ridges, forests, and wetlands. And in 1837, they sold all of this land to the federal government. And quickly in time, that land was bought, brought, bought up. And a new individual came onto the scene. This individual was named Jack. This record is a bill of sale from the Finley Records here at the University of Mississippi in the archives. Jack, when he came to this land, didn't bring with him what the Chickasaw Indians took away when they left. They took with them the understanding of the connections between themselves and non-human species. They took with them the understanding that a wetland influences a forest and the ridge influences the valley. Jack brought with him only a couple of things. His worth, $485. His sex, a boy. His name, a singular Anglo name, Jack. An assumed age, 11. And a complexion of skin, because this wasn't about black and white. And Jack would go on to erase the entire history of the Chickasaw Indians and everything that they knew. His sole mission, as he was forced to do, was remove any trace of those species that the Chickasaw revered and held a connection with. And in doing so, they would replace it with one species, cotton. This photo that I'll show you now is the oldest photo we know of Holly Springs. It's in the square. And it's what promoted Holly Springs to be the cotton capital of Mississippi in the 1840s and 50s the wealthiest cotton town, the wealthiest county of cotton in the state, and in that sense, in the country. But luckily, this land was one day passed down to a pair of sisters who understood the importance of diversity. These two sisters, Ruth and Margaret Finley, understood that there was more to a piece of land than what you can take out of it. And so I want to bring us back to the present day. And I want to talk about one single relationship, or a series of them, around one plant as just a microcosm of the larger picture. This shed I'm showing you now is our potting shed for our native plant nursery at Strawberry Plains. Turn your attention to that vine on the front left there. That is not kudzu. This vine is pipe vine. Pipe vine gets its name from the shape of its flower, which is like a Sherlock Holmes pipe held from the front. Pipe vine emits an aroma and has colors that attract in flies and gnats. These flies and gnats fly in, but once they are in, they are trapped. They, the flower itself releases coarse hairs that keeps them in, like when you're driving into a parking garage and the metal stakes come up. And once they are inside, they are bringing on their back the last remnants from the last flower they were at, another pipe vine. And they deposit that pollen and meet a female flower. And once that relationship is met, the female flower withers and a male flower comes up and the male flower releases pollen onto it and those coarse hairs lay down and the fly moves on. But I'm not talking about just the fly today. Let's talk about the next insect that has a relationship with pipe vine. You see, the pipe vine swallowtail is a specialist. And this is something that we take for granted in the world of biodiversity, even in the world of diversity, that we all have a history, we all have a role. Pipe vine swallowtails will lay about 20 eggs on pipe vine. And pipe vine swallowtail eggs will eventually mature into a caterpillar. And these caterpillars will feed on pipe vine, but because they are a specialist, they have evolved with the pipe vine toxins that are in their leaves. And they use this to their advantage because they go to their next larval stage and they will change colors and they'll continue to eat. But that foraging does not go unnoticed. Soon enough, another individual is going to come in. And this is a crab spider. And this species of crab spider has legs that tend to blend into the veins of the pipe vine leaf. But this crab spider is an ambush predator. And he will come in and he will snag one of these and, well, we'll see if he'll eat another pipe vine after eating this one. But one of these individuals will eventually make it and it will mature into an adult caterpillar. And that adult caterpillar, caterpillar will once again find a place to hang. And it will hang at a spot like our front porch of our visitor center and it will form a chrysalis, and inside that chrysalis will become the next stage, the beauty, the magic of metamorphosis. And we have a beautiful pipe vine swallowtail. Isn't that a lovely story? Isn't that beautiful? 
Why does it matter? Why should we care about caterpillars? Well, if you were something that feeds on caterpillars, you would probably care. This is a white-eyed vireo feeding on a caterpillar. 96% of terrestrial species feed on insects, particularly Lepidoptera, the family of moths, butterflies, and skippers. If you are Robert Kimdichi or Laquan Treadwell, if you are a black bear, then 23% of your diet comes from insects. If you're a red fox, 25% of your diet comes from insects. What if you're a chickadee? A chickadee will feed a single brood, a single group, in a nest of two to three individuals between six and 9,000 caterpillars within their raising. So this all seems well, fun, and good, but what does this mean for us? Well, today, are we really that different than Jack? Is what we're doing today really that far-fetched? We are coming in. We are removing all the diversity. We are making the landscape have only one type of plant, our lawns, our Bermuda grass. And so I ask you today, as you go home, as you leave this place, take a notice of what is in plain sight. When you go on the campus today at Oxford, take notice of the main tree on this campus, crepe myrtle. They replace three every day. How many species of Lepidoptera, of the moth and butterflies, genus, do you think that crepe myrtle support? Here in the U.S., three. What about ginkgo trees? Three. What about oaks? 557. We all have an ingrained history, a history that brings with it an importance, a perspective, a connection that ties all of us into this inner web that is life itself. I hope that you will go from here and see what's in plain sight. Thank you.